Yes, perfect. So if you're clicking on one of those links, um, if one is filled up, use the next one. Um, it will redirect you here to workshop studio that Chris is sharing on his screen. And just follow the instructions. Um, you will have to log in for the one time in the beginning. Um, as we're all internal, you can choose the Amazon employee login. That's the fastest option using your Amazon um, dot star, whatever dot com, de, uh, whichever Amazon address you have. And yeah, if you're running out of the limit, use the next link. We have six links here. So if one says it's out of limit, check the next one. <laughs> and you must log in as an Amazon employee. Right. And yep, US East one, that's correct. And follow all of the instructions they're logging in. The join link shared has already the access code, so everything should work smoothly. And once you're logged in, you should see the screen that Chris is sharing here. All of the links are in the Slack channel. Join us in the Slack channel. And we're reposting here also the link to Slack, just making sure everyone has it. And you must log in as Amazon employee. If you're seeing something that says you are not allowed listed to join this event, uh, just make sure you use the Amazon employee. A uh, couple of people in that category, Ancha. Uh, okay, if it says event is at capacity, go to one of the other links. So there were seven or eight links up above, just choose a different one. I assure you there is enough capacity. Um, if, you, if you see you're not allow listed, make sure you're using an Amazon email address. So either Amazon.com, Amazon.de, or any other country Amazon address you have, but make yeah, sure it's the Amazon it. address. If you're still having that issue, DM us. It is limited to Amazon folks, so you would need oh. to have your Amazon address. We need audible. Has anyone another okay. domain? Okay. Switch to one? Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if it asks for the access code, I believe someone said it's at the end of the uh, link. Yes. The, uh, the access you... code. Yeah. Up yeah. Here. If you click that link that we shared in Slack, it has the access code embedded. So it should auto complete that. But if it's for some reason, it's asking you to just grab that little part at the end of the link. And yes, we'll, we'll walk through it together. If you wanna go ahead, <laughs> if you're curious, you can, um, but Chris will walk us here through the individual steps. We're just giving it a few minutes to get the majority here into the accounts. If the event is at capacity, use one of the next links. Okay, and uh, let me, okay, so instance type, you should not have to do, okay. So also the, um, yeah, the other thing, the reason that we like to use Slack is so that you can paste screenshots. So with any support questions, just grab a quick screenshot. It It is like lightning fast, it's way faster to do it that way. Um, today, we are only going to do part one by the way, so. Part two. Or, or oh yeah, sorry, part two, <laughs> part two. We're only gonna do part two. And I've actually added a couple things to part two um, that no one has done yet. Uh, Lab 126, okay. Um, Ancha, I'll do, uh, okay. So lab 26, do you not have an Amazon account? I guess not. Huh? Right. Uh, we are not doing part one today. That is, um, that was covered actually in a, a, that that will be covered at some point, but today we only have a couple hours and we're gonna focus only on the Gen AI and only on the, 
uh, cool, fun, um, heft and reinforcement learning stuff. On check the allow list stuff. That's pretty easy to fix, I think, right? Yeah, um, I'm looking into it right now. We would have to go. Yeah, can someone just use the Amazon? Yeah, if you can just use Amazon.com, that that'll that'll work best. Um, so you can also re-deliver this workshop, by the way. And so someone's asking, do you have access to the workshop? So there's two answers to that question. You have access to it in the, in the fact that you can actually re-deliver this. This is on Workshop Studio. Um, the, uh, but you, you would have to create an event and provision, you know, the accounts. The other answer is that this particular uh, workshop, we will keep up for the rest of the day, but we will need to terminate it. The third answer is all of the code is public and we're going to share the code here in a bit. Um, okay. So, Ansha, for Sorab's thing, can you ask uh, which, which of these he's actually using? Which um, one, and then we could change that. I'd have to create an account. Yeah, I'm I'm fixing the lab one two six right now. Um, if you can reply which lab link you're using, I can make sure you get in. Ignore the authorization exception, as uh, David has pointed out. Everything works, I assure you. Event access code is in the original URL that you clicked. So lab two, right. Lab two, the notebook is going to be, so let me, let me uh, move my face out of the way so I can click it. And boom, and oh, there's a picture of us. So yeah, this workshop, uh, Clay Elmore was on earlier. Uh, I think he had to go somewhere. So it's just gonna be me and Ansha delivering with Mark Roy kind of hanging out uh, in, in the background. Okay, so uh, what you wanna do is click open AWS console down here in the lower left. You can read all the stuff you want, but Everything that we're gonna to do today is in the notebooks. So I would just focus on the notebooks. And what you wanna do is, uh, okay, so, uh-oh, uh, we have Elemental as well. Yeah, Ancha, uh, maybe, okay, does Elemental not allow amazon.com? Uh, so we might have to add elemental in there too. We are trying to be uh, extra careful with the, with allowing people in, but I guess it. Yeah. And again, people are asking the event access code. I see here, um, the join link actually has that at the very end. So it should auto populate. If it doesn't just grab the join the access code that's embedded in this lab workshop link that you've clicked, it's right at the end. So you can grab that part. Okay, so Arnab, uh, just hang tight. What you wanna do is click over here, down here in the lower left. And so you would click this. That's gonna get you over to here. You wanna get into SageMaker. And uh, Ben, I didn't answer your question yet because I can't remember. I think it's notebook number five. And keep in mind that you do not need to run notebooks one through four. So it, it's a little confusing because uh, we're kind of starting in, in the middle. Um, only part two. You, yeah, and you can explore the other sections, that's right. Okay, ah, you have to actually clone. Oh, I guess I kind of missed that part, didn't I, Asha? Have to, yeah, if you click on Workshop Studio, actually, got a little bit of help. 
and you could follow these instructions here workshop setup boom 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 all the way down to cloning cloning the repo yeah chris why don't you do a quick walk through the setup here and i'll keep an eye on people um that's still on board but let's get people into the environment gotcha we're about 15 minutes in right so yeah. uh Make sure you get to studio in studio, you should see some form of open studio like this. And all of these instructions are on my screen here under workshop setup. Click on open studio. Okay, we do have one person saying failed to start kernel, Duncan. Uh, so let's keep an eye on that one. I'm gonna try it here. I checked with the studio team last night and we do appear to have enough capacity. So hopefully, but if you could do a screenshot. Okay, so it looks like you're trying a T32XL, which is uh, purposely disabled the all of the kernels except for the ones that we need today. So if you follow the instructions here, it should. I guess it's in in the actual notebook where we say uh, the short of it is. M5 to Excel. And you can thank the folks at the SageMaker Studio. Okay, if you're seeing events is at capacity, change to one of those other. Yeah, Ancha, are you on Mittens? Uh, yep. thing here? Okay. All right, I'm gonna keep moving ahead. Um, gonna do, and all the instructions are here and Ancha and will uh, help everyone get caught up if you're taking things slow. So you have to clone this here from the terminal. And I do know that there's ways to pre uh, pull these with lifecycle configs and all that jazz. Uh, yeah, but we're not doing that. Okay, and once you clone it, you can double click here. So yeah, Ansha, can you share the links? Uh, just to keep it all on, here, I'll share it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Another link here. If you're at capacity, try one of those other ones. And I shared it here in the WebEx too for folks who who still struggle to get on Slack. So that's the only portion, um, and obviously the Q and A. But yeah, try if you can look for the data science on AWS channel just by its name. Seems like some folks are able to join if it, they couldn't join with the link before. Okay, and when select a notebook, it should automatically start the M five two XL. And if you all think this is slow, try doing this for a thousand people with their own separate eyes and guard accounts that are in different states of chaos and general confusion after you know a couple of years of development. So you should see now, uh, Ben, I said that you would start with uh, Notebook 05. Uh, it's actually, we do have to run um, the 01 setup dependencies because that that gets everything set up. Um, Keyshore, if you follow these instructions here, just gonna paste it. And basically um, terminal. Okay, and if uh, you you have to run zero zero and zero one. So, and the kernel's gonna take a minute or two to start up 
you know, again, we can provide feedback to the studio team to ask them why uh, this takes so long. But what's happening here in the background is um, studio container or there's an instance being provisioned and <laughs> and a uh, container is being <laughs> is being provisioned. And then what we're gonna do is do pip installs inside of the uh, container running on this M52XL instance. And then from then on, we will start with 05, 06. And um, we even have some extras here that I'm gonna point you to in a bit. You could run overview inside of the dependencies at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You don't even have to run overview, honestly, but that's just kind of a sanity check. Okay, to and we do talk about how to run notebooks here. So Jane, if you want to stick around, or you could just watch. You could do the workshop later, um, but we will be tearing it down at towards the end of the day. Okay, and my kernel. Recording will be shared internally. Yep, people are jumping on other calls, so that's fine. Let's see everything here. Uh, okay, if you, so Sunita, if you double click, Just double click on that directory on the data science and AWS directory. Yeah, and folks, please feel free to help each other out. That way we can uh, keep moving ahead. So what to do after cloning? Sure, so double click into, so this is what it will look like when you clone. You go back into the file browser here, double click, and you want to run overview. And for those of you that are not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, they're actually pretty simple. Uh, you can, so first of all, make sure this says 8 vCPU and 32 gig. If not, you're on the wrong instance type. By default, it should be on the correct instance type. That's how we designed it. But sometimes our friends at the studio team uh, have found a bug or two where it, it does not go to uh, the assigned M5 to XL. So we, we've seen that a few times, but hopefully not. Um, yes, yeah, still running overview, Vanessa. So at the top, it says it's uh, loading the kernel. It takes a couple minutes. Uh, Anuj, can you share a screenshot in a thread? Ignore all errors and warnings. Yes, that's right. If you have no kernel at the top here, yes, click on this and you would select uh, the, the kernel. Yes, you can host the workshop later. Uh, I have a link to that. Uh, yep. Cool. Okay. So uh, the way to use these Jupyter Notebooks is you do, um, you kind of start at the top, you hit shift enter. It's just, if you have never used a notebook, uh, now is gonna be the time that you figure these out. Uh, and you don't have to do any of these, these things here, just keep hitting shift enter. Um, one thing I always like to point out, and there's a few folks that don't know it, but you can actually render HTML inside of these notebook cells. So this actually comes in pretty handy. Uh, we have a quick plug for our book and everything here too. I'll skip over. And I do want to talk about the use case here. Um, 
we are going to fine tune a foundational model that's open source. It's called Flan T5. Uh, it's actually out of Google. We'll be using the Hugging Face uh, Transformers library, the whole Hugging Face ecosystem uh, at like AWS. We are partners with with uh, Hugging Face. Um, Sheng Yu, you're you're on the wrong kernel. Uh, switch to okay, two XO. Yep. And the uh, use case here is something Manny mentioned, and I think maybe even Emily mentioned, which is we're we're going to take dialogue, uh, and you know this is like a just an open source data set here, public data set that simulates you know person one talking to person two. Um, back and forth, even sometimes three people, four people. And we're actually going to uh, train Flan T5 or what's called fine tuning Flan T5, um, which is a foundation model to learn how to summarize. Now, Flan T5 already knows how to summarize based on some public data sets that it has already been trained on and fine tuned for this task of summarization. However, we are going to give it our data set or a, a data set that we're pretending is ours for the duration uh, of this workshop that's called Dialogue Sum. And there's a link to the data set here. You can, if you click on it, you can go over here, zoom in. So this is a dialogue and a human annotated summary. So some human somewhere has said, has read this dialogue and actually provided a summary. What we're going to try to do is to improve or, you know, at least match the human baseline because we're kind of trusting humans here. And so uh, in a couple of the talks earlier today, things were mentioned like SageMaker Ground Truth that, you know, has a nice UI where you can um, be shown the dialogue and then you you have a way to choose what's a better summary and things. So let's assume all of that has been done and we've been presented uh, with this data set and we're, we're trying to fine tune um, our model to um, provide a good summary of this. And now the use cases for this, think of like a, uh, you know, support ticket, right? Um, if if you're at a startup, you're using Zendesk, let's say, and you have support tickets, and maybe each week you just want to show a quick summary or per customer show a, a quick summary of, you know, all the dialogues that have happened back and forth between, um, you know, the support staff and that customer, but like without having to go in through all the details, right? And so the summary is really nice to do that. And also think of, you know, summarization as um, I've seen startups that are trying to summarize your life, basically. And, you know, there's there's uh, I think this one startup called um, was it called Mem? Yeah, uh, Mem something. And it's like a portal that you go into and, of course, hook up everything that you have, you know, Google Calendar and all that stuff and essentially summarize what's going on in your life and, and the ability to execute tasks and do everything through natural language and, you know, kind of fun. But today we're just gonna stick with dialogue and then shrink it down. And then we'll be running both qualitative, so, you know, sort of human eyeball, how, how well are these summaries? And second, we'll also uh, be doing quantitative. So there's ways using different evaluation metrics to um, say whether or not a particular summary that's been generated by the model is actually close to the original uh, dialogue and using a bunch of statistical methods like longest common sequence between the original and the summary um, and you know ngram and skipgram and all kinds of fun techniques. So we will we'll get into all that in a bit. Today, we will not be doing the pipeline. If you want to later today, you could do it afterward, but uh, today we will just be sticking with notebooks. Some of you might be asking, what is this goofy stuff down here? Um, you know, again, Ansh and I have been running uh, at scale workshops for the better part of three years now. Um, yeah, almost four years. What we found is when we're, we're trying to be frugal with the resources by using, you know, something like an M5 2XL, which is actually pretty big. Uh, like Ansh and I used to use the T3 mediums 
um, and the uh, models these days are just too big. But um, it's really a good idea to clean up the resources. That way, the, the kernel, you can run more notebooks in the kernel before it runs out of memory. So um, I always like to just kind of run it. Um, now, the other thing to point out is at some point in this workshop, you will get tired of hitting shift enter, shift enter. So there is this way to go up here and do kernel, restart, and run all. Okay, and so I'm going to actually do that here. I'm just going to run all. Um, that's going to run all the cells. That basically simulates you hitting shift enter, shift enter, shift enter a bunch of times. At first, probably for the first you know four or five notebooks, I would do shift enter just to read what's going on, see what's going on. Um, and so let's see. Uh, bucket is not defined. Okay, if uh, that's okay. So someone, so Nathan, you're running one of the notebooks, probably without running the setup dependencies. So after zero zero overview, let's run setup dependencies. This is going to um, install. Uh, this is going to do all the pip install. So this is a good one to do restart kernel and run all cells. So Anche, can you keep an eye on Nathan if you get a chance? Make sure. Um, uh, so uh, you big, you are okay. You're in good shape. Just keep running. <laughs> Bored. Okay, so, and what this is doing, just ignore all of these warnings here. And this is installing uh, PyTorch, PyTorch data, transformers, very important. This is the hugging face library. That's essentially the basis for all of this. Um, and yeah, and, you know, please keep in mind that me and Ansha and Clay did not build this workshop overnight, right? This this has taken months and months and you know many customer interactions to understand like what's relevant, what's useful, what what's not useful. Um, also note that you know some of these pip installs are not necessarily relevant for the middle portion that we're going to do today, which is 05, uh, you know, really through probably 07, and then a few extras that I'm gonna. Uh, point you to once we get this far. Yeah, so after 00, zero and zero 01, you would want to jump into 05. So I'm waiting for setup dependencies to complete here. And then, so while, <clears throat> while 01 is finishing, yeah, let me jump into 05 real quick and just kind of remind everyone. Oh, and then also, you know, one thing Ancha and I have learned over the years is we need to put in these checks up at the top because otherwise it's, it's difficult for us to debug. So if you see some, you know, boilerplate stuff here, set up dependencies, um, you know, these are things that we use when uh, people, send us a screenshot and this helps us to debug. Also, one other thing to point out, if you're not familiar, um, in uh, Jupyter, you can actually do percent store. Now, percent store will store the value of a, a variable that you can then retrieve later. So I just show like a quick example here where I store it and then I uh, retrieve it. This lets me go from notebook five to six or, or you know, five to any other notebook afterward, and I can retrieve the value that was stuffed in there. And so think of it like, you know, if you're familiar with like the old school kind of, uh, you know, web development where you have a session, think of it like a notebook session variable. We're gonna stuff it in and then, um, yeah. So uh, Sheng Yu, yep, you do 0001 and then just jump to 05. You do not need to run 02, 03, or 04. And in fact, I wouldn't uh, do it today because it, um, I mean, 
you could run it. It's just, we have to jump right into O5. Yeah, global variables, that's right. Yeah, and make sure like my setup dependencies looks like it's still running. So I'm going to hold off here and just double check. It looks like you just finished. Yep. Okay. So let's jump over. Uh, so we can jump over to 05. Now, after the initial checks, this is the model that we're going to use. Okay. And you can go look this up on the Hugging Face site uh, if you want to. Let me. Kind of, I could paste the link in here if you're interested. Um, that's so. This is the, now the reason that that we chose Flan T5. Flan T5 is a is a it is probably of all the customers that I work with, and you know most of the applied scientists that I work with within AWS, they all love Flan T5. Now Flan T5 is a is a general purpose model um, and can do a lot of different tasks. It's been it's been fine-tuned uh, to do chain of thought reasoning where it can kind of break apart complex requests and you know break it down into uh, multiple things. Um, it we can you know provide instructions. And so this has actually been uh, pre-fine-tuned for us. And so Flan actually uh, I, I can't remember what it stands for, uh, like exactly, but FLAN is a, a data set or a series of data sets that are um, that were used to fine tune the base T5 model that came out of Google. Um, okay, and so just know that you know we could do a lot with FLAN T5, and so that's why we use it. There are other models that are better at other tasks. Summarization is actually something Plan T5 is good at, and we are going to take that one step further and introduce our, uh, you know, quote unquote, like data set that we're, we're is like also a public data set, but we're pretending like it's a, you know, support chat uh, data set. Okay. Um, all right, and so Plan T5, that's what we're going to start with. Here's that data set that we're going to use that I had shown earlier. Also, you know, if you go to huggingface.co, uh, we work very closely with these folks. So we love um, working with them. Where did dialogues on go? Data sets right here. So that's a link to, oh yeah. Yeah, T5 stands for text to text transfer transformer. Is that, that's what the five T's are, that's hilarious. All right, so I'm going to do one by one here. I'm going to make sure I'm on the right instance type. Uh oh, looks like something happened here. Let me see. Yeah, so I got to go to Flan T, or sorry, I have to go to M52XL. That's the instance type that we're using. This is a good mix of CPU and memory. Um, and, you know, just so you know, everything with a GPU is just faster. So, <laughs> However, GPUs are expensive. They are limited at scale like this. We, we just need to stick with CPUs. Um, so some of the labs will actually, you know, take maybe five or 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes to run, uh, but we'll uh, get through it here. All right, so these first few lines of code here that, that are actually uh, significant, this is where we're using this library from Hugging Face that can load the data set and can do it in parallel and can do it, you know, um, at a pretty good scale here and also can, you know, split the data if needed and some other stuff. So here we're just going to dump out what this data set looks like. Here's our dialogue that we're planning to summarize. And here is the human, uh, you know, think of this like the label in your traditional machine learning. You know, this is the input. And this is the actual label. And we, we are going to show Flan T5 a whole bunch of these input label, input label, input label that come from that dialogue sum uh, data set. And Flan T5, the weights are going to slightly change to learn our data set and to um, 
you know, make uh, better predictions as to the, the summary of that dialogue. Okay, now all of this stuff is gonna be like, you know, could be potentially out of your knowledge range and I'm just gonna touch on it. Please don't, don't get uh, discouraged by this. You know, tokenizer, for example, is a fancy way of saying it's gonna take this text, it's gonna break it up into what are called tokens. And tokens are, um, think of tokens like a single word. However, in a lot of cases, the words are broken up into partial words. And we're not gonna get into that. Actually, our book uh, covers it um, pretty well, but there's you know lots and lots of like info on this stuff. And again, make sure if you are seeing like data set now found or, or, or sorry, library now found, make sure 01 has run to completion and that uh, you're on the M52XL up here. I just saw some notes. Okay, so the tokenizer is what's going to um, handle breaking up our text and putting it, you know, think of it like being able to project these, uh, you know, paragraphs, this text into a numeric vector space. And typically these vocabularies for, you know, um, these different models are like in, in the 30,000 token range. So think of a 30,000 dimension uh, vector space, right? Way beyond what the human can actually think of. These are called the embedding spaces often. And every, um, you know, dialogue conversation ends up as a vector in, you know, of that is made up of those tokens, okay? And so that gives us the ability to, um, you know, for example, compare uh, different uh, summaries to each other. And so if you were in like Manny's talk earlier to do clustering and to do classification and to do sentiment analysis, here we are going to use the similar properties where we tokenize and then um, uh, we are going to use that to summarize. All right, and this is where we actually load our model. So this, you know, model checkpoint uh, is going to be FLAN T5. The term checkpoint, by the way, is um, a very common term. Think of it like, you know, these, right, these neural networks are never really done training, right? And in fact, today we're taking a neural network called FLAN T5 and we are continuing to fine tune it. And so think of a saved model as just another checkpoint. And so um, we're taking a checkpoint that, that Google released, you know, I don't know, two years ago or something, and we are going to, to load it. That's why it's called from uh, pre-trained and then passing a checkpoint name. And then we're gonna create our own checkpoint, which we're then gonna use, you know, throughout the workshop. Okay, um, I'm gonna pause here. Ancha, anything that we need to know about? No, I think we're good to continue. A couple of questions here. I'm helping a couple of folks picking the right kernel still, but I think we are we're good. Um, question about the book: How much theory do we cover in the book for folks who yeah, want to like catch yeah. up on the basics? Yeah, yeah, I think a fair amount. Um, what's good about the book is it's uh, you know theory on um, kind of natural language and how it has evolved over the years. From the early days of you know word devec and like ngram and um and then you know yeah it kind of takes us into the modern world but also focuses on how to apply it on sage um but yeah let's keep moving ahead here uh and yes if we're we are using flan t5 base which i believe is um actually i can't remember the number of parameters because we we switch models at some point um, but there, but these models come in different sizes and yeah, I'll say if the highest you can use is almost always the better, uh, model to use or the best model to use, um, the largest flan T5, I believe is 11 billion parameters, which would require that we switch to a larger instance type, which we weren't comfortable doing given availability and, you know, customer priority and, and things like that. But yes. Um, and also you have to be careful when you're using GPUs. We are, are not using GPUs today, but when you use GPUs, you are 
you have to pay attention to how much RAM your model takes up. And oftentimes you have to split that model. Um, I, I believe Emily maybe talked about model parallelism and the ability to split a single model across multiple GPUs. We didn't really have to do this, you know, maybe two or three years ago, because uh, models like BERT and, you know, could could actually fit onto a single GPU, but we've like blown way past that now with these larger models. Um, and so one of the benefits, by the way, of using CPUs is that you do have access to a much larger, uh, like addressable memory space. And you're not always thinking necessarily that I have a fixed 40 gig or a 24 gig single GPU and I have to split my model up and stuff. You just have continuous space, um, uh, like relatively, you know, in CPU land. Okay, um, Manny went into a little bit about prompt engineering. So let's let's take now all of this fancy code here is just passing in uh, our, you know, dialogue uh, converting it into these tokens and then passing it into the actual model. So you'll see this code show up over and over and you just got to kind of tune it out and say, okay, this looks really ugly. I don't know what's going on, but I, you know, I'm telling you what's going on. It's not that, uh, difficult. So input IDs comes out of the tokenizer. We're saying how many new tokens do we want this particular run or this particular prediction to make? Uh, so 50 tokens. Now, uh, keep in mind, tokens are not characters. Tokens are uh, words or word fragments. Um, and skip special tokens. Special tokens are, you know, um, yeah, probably too much to cover here, but we're just saying just like generate raw text here for us. All right, so, so let's see what happens. So here's the actual input. Uh, and this is without any fine tuning. This is just Flan T5 straight out of the box. We've done nothing. And uh, we see that this doesn't even realize that person two was involved. This is not a very good, um, you know, summary. And so, you know, Flan T5 straight out of the box without any prompting. So all we're doing is just giving it a, a blob, but we're not actually asking Flan T5 to do anything. And so, that's the, the the most basic prompt engineering is we are going to add some instruction, right? And if you recall, Flan T5 has been trained with instructions. And in fact, most of the time when people talk about fine tuning, they do mean fine tuning with instructions. And it's you telling uh, the model what you want to do, and then um, you know giving it a, a sample of of what uh, the uh, that like result or that response should be. And I think this is another one, right? So we do, uh, let's just do two of them here and see. Okay, it's not that great. Now, what we're doing here is adding just a very basic prompt. And, you know, I think Manny uh, showed this maybe in like one of the slides, but we're gonna do it here, where instead of just giving it the blob of, of our dialogue, um, we are, actually going to wrap it in, you know, what some people call commands, typically called instructions. And uh, this is just kind of a fancy way of, you know, building a template and then printing out the text. So here we're saying summarize the following conversation and then saying put the summary, you know, right after this. So the, the model generated, the train is about to leave. <laughs> so not very good. And again, the human baseline, this comes directly from the data set, is you know, relatively accurate. Um, we'll see over time that we will actually be able to generate oftentimes a better summary than the human baseline, okay? So let's do it for the second example, uh, talking about a picnic. The model generates, the weather report says it will be sunny all day. Um, versus what we're really trying to do, which is understand the conversation, you know, a summary of, um, you know, person one, person two. Now, somehow, uh, oh, yes, actually, the human baseline recognizes that, you know, person uh, one is mom and person two uh, is May, which is, which, you know, a human can do, right? Uh, but now, there are also other prompts. So here we showed 
summarize the following conversation. And this is where if you have a linguistics background or you you are, are just creative in some way, uh, you know, you can actually choose different ways to uh, instruct the model and and see if it's going to give us anything better. So here's a slightly different way to do it, which is dialogue colon, give the dialogue. Here, I'll just run it and print it out. Dialogue colon, and then say, what was going on, you know, basically up there in this dialogue. The model says Tom is late for the train. Um, the baseline summary is person one is in a hurry. Tom tells person one there is plenty of time. So while the model generated something decent, you know, I still think we can get better. So now here's a here's the second example here between May and uh, her mom and then Daniel. So here, this seems to be slightly better, right? Person one wants to prepare <laughs> for the picnic. May, um, you know, which is person two, uh, has offered to help prepare. So that's what the model generated. We can compare that qualitatively to um, what was generated with the with that other prompt. Now, the whole field of prompt engineering, by the way, is just trying to figure that out. What is the best prompt for the data set that you're using for the model that you've chosen? And there's all kinds of subtle tricks. And, you know, yeah, I would argue this is probably the most complicated part. Um, all the other stuff we can kind of snap into, you know, uh, gradient descent and like other, you know, and like loss functions. Um, and, oh, by the way, there are ways to actually automatically figure out the best prompt. And that's actually called prompt tuning, which we're not going to get into today, but we do cover it in uh, like other resources. But think of it like hyperparameter tuning, where, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to give a discrete prompt. I'm going to start off random, just like any other, you know, machine learning problem where we start random with, you know, random weights. They, they are like all over the place. After giving it enough examples of dialogue and summary, we then, right, can uh, derive the best prompt. And keep in mind that, that the best derived prompt is often not even human readable, which is you know kind of mind blowing. So there's a whole field of study on this called uh, parameter efficient fine tuning. That's one of the examples that I'm going to show later. Although not in prompt tuning, I'm going to show something that we see at almost every customer right now. Something called LoRa, L-O-R-A, uh, which is really exciting. Um, but just know that you know here we're kind of doing the most naive thing, but we're we're bounded by our human knowledge of language. And there, there are actually ways to learn the best prompts. Um, and also I saw, I think it was Garrett, um, uh, who I actually reached out separately, might uh, try to uh, collaborate with him, who has his own sort of framework to you know, decide the best prompts and, and to do prompt engineering. So uh, prompt engineering is a, a uh, I I would call it a bit of a squishy field. People have different opinions on it, but just know that there are ways to actually, uh, you know, sort of hyperparameter um, tune your prompts because they do end up being very specific uh, to the data set to the model. Okay, and I believe you know Manny mentioned this in the slides briefly. There's something called few shot prompting, um, uh, you, you know, one shot prompting. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it's it's relatively straightforward, but just know that instead of just passing in a single dialogue, okay, so I'm kind of starting at the bottom of this, this cell number 24 here. This is what we had been passing in, is just here's a dialogue and asking the model what's going on. We can actually do something that's called, you know, uh, multi-shot or few shot. Uh, where I can give two examples. So now this is called few shot. This I would call this two shot. Uh, this is something Clay and I, one of the creators of the the this workshop, were, were just 
kind of going back and forth about last night. But um, if you know you stick by the definition of few being three, few shot, you would have three full examples. So this is dialogue with the summary, dialogue with the summary. So here we have two of those. That's why it's called two shot. And then the third one, we're asking it for the summary. So in true three shot, which I would say is few shot, you would actually have one more here. Um, this is often confusing. I wouldn't spend too much time on it. The key here is that whenever you, if you're trying to completely avoid fine tuning um, because you just don't want to deal with it or you don't have the you know, GPUs to do it or the, or the time to do it, you can actually get really far with prompt engineering and few shot and you know multi shot uh, like inference. What this does, this is very uh, likely the the most sort of cognitive aspect of these LLMs. By the way, so fine tuning, you know, all the reinforcement learning, all that stuff's fine. This is actually called in context learning, and this is providing you know these examples. And then, um, then asking it in all inside of one one big prompt, asking the model to change its behavior on the fly, and uh, you know, and and solve this this task, which is summarization for this very last one. And so, cognitively, this is where like we're not actually changing the weights of the model, right? And so that's why this is much lighter weight. Um, yeah, like Manny earlier said, always start with, you know, prompt engineering, see how far you can get. The downside is from this point on, you would always have to provide two or three examples with the actual one that's coming, you know, live that you're asking it to do. So I always kind of thought this was ridiculous from an application developer standpoint and from, you know, just normal, uh, like systems, uh, you know, like why I'm passing in a bunch of answers when I, it should just be able to do it. So, um, but just know that uh, this is something interesting. And so the few shot response is Tom is late. He has to catch the train. So, you know, we see something a little bit more like interesting here and like you can compare this to the uh, zero shot up above, right? Um, so, yeah, summary, always start with prompt engineering. Uh, if you're like me, you, you actually want to fine tune these things and, you know, um, probably uh, see how well we can do um, with that. So, any questions there? Yeah, Ancha, anything to highlight? Yeah, just to make sure um, there's a little bit of confusion. So prompt engineering is not changing the model weights. And, and right. you just, I think, said that, right, to make that clear. Um, there is a separate te technique. I think you touched briefly on it to find the optimal prompts, which is called prompt tuning. It's not the same yeah. thing. It's not the same slightly thing. confusing with the naming. Mm -hmm. um, but prompt tuning is a separate technique trying to identify the best prompts. And, and that technique is modifying the weights. But yeah, I know it's super confusing. It's almost the same terms, um, but there's a lot of difference here. <laughs> yeah, if you if you remember when you know you were first getting into machine learning and you were trying to straddle, or or I, I'll just speak about me. I was trying to straddle terms that were used in the statistical area as well as terms used in the you know practical machine learning, and there's a lot of overlap. There's there's a whole lot of confusion. Um, the what you have to do is just listen to enough of these talks to kind of get the terms. And uh, I mean, even this week, I was on a call with a customer who had never even heard of, of prompt tuning and they were confusing it with prompt engineering. And we were working with um, a third party uh, provider of, of these, these types of systems. And so I was basically acting as a translator between, I said, no, 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 you know, the third party company is talking about prompt tuning. Uh, you know, you customer are talking about prompt engineering. These are totally different things. They, they are, you know, like the way that, that I think of it is prompt tuning is like the automated, you know, way to, to do what we're manually doing here, which is trying, you know, different prompts. But 
prompt tuning is not limited to the, the human's knowledge of you know language. It can try anything and and is more. It's using deep learning to uh, find the best prompt. Now that said, I like honestly don't see a whole lot of folks using prompt tuning. I see a whole ton of people doing this lightweight prompt engineering, and I see a whole ton of people doing fine tuning, which we're going to get to next. Uh, but prompt tuning just kind of gets sort of lost in the middle. And then in the extra section uh, towards the end, I'm going to show a really cool technique uh, that's called LoRa um, that will improve upon the fine tuning that we're doing right now. And that is super popular. Every customer asks about that. All right. And people are wondering why we're all getting the same response from the model. So if the temperature is set to very low, uh, we, I think we could be, there, is there a seed that we're setting somewhere? That was something Manny mentioned as well, too. If, if you have the exact same, uh, prompts or sorry, the, the, uh, yeah, the same prompts and the same seed. Um, but are you saying if you raise the temperature, people are still seeing. No, I don't think they're, they're not playing with the temperature setting. They're just, just with each other. We all get the same yeah. response. Yeah. Yeah, there's, and if you do have a low temperature, then it, it, you are not encouraging the model to explore basically. So it's just sticking with the, the pure probabilities. Yeah. Um, and you can play with those. Uh, let's see, where would you, where do we specify temperature? I think you would specify temperature here, maybe, right? Temperature equals 0 0.9. And uh, yeah, I already killed that, but you can add this, I think, to model generate something like that. And then I think there's a little bit confusion still. So prompt engineering, prompt tuning, rag. Yeah. I think a couple of people threw in rag, <laughs> um, oh, fine tuning, pre training. So maybe just quickly getting that in in order. Do you want to just briefly yeah. walk through the right. sequence here? And so prompt engineering, one sort of clever way to improve the prompt is to use an external data source, right? That, that you retrieve, that's the R in, in RAG, to say, okay, you know, summarize the following conversation, uh, let's say with this, extra piece of info that I have on my intranet in my SharePoint, you know, uh, like server somewhere and stuff that in to the prompt. So I call it prompt stuffing. Uh, I think the real technical term would be augmentation. I think that's the A, uh, retrieval augmented uh, generation. So, you know, think of it like this. You say summarize the following and then you would reach out to some external data source and add in, you know, some more uh, context from uh, your internal, uh, you know, database, employee database, or, you know, something like that. So maybe, and this is creepy, I, I didn't mean to go the uh, creepy route here, but you would say summarize the following conversation, uh, you know, for um, a specific user uh, or a specific employee, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And here's the most recent emails from, from that employee. Yeah, bad example, but you know, all of this, by the way, just comes down to figuring out the best prompt for the task that you're trying to do. Um, and it's a very lightweight way to do it. Uh, there's even within SageMaker uh, for Jumpstart is our, you know, uh, foundation model hub kind of thing they have what's called a playground that you could just try different prompts and keep hitting, you know, submit, 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 generate. Um, and then at some point you could get into these rag techniques and yeah, we're not covering rag here, but, uh, there's actually quite a lot of uh, resources out there on rag by now. Okay. For, for time's sake, uh, we have one hour left. We'll probably go maybe uh, 20 minutes over or so, cause I do want to get to the good stuff. Or, or sorry, to the like extras. So I'm actually gonna do a quick run, um, a restart and run all. Um, and so you don't really have to restart the kernel 
if you haven't run it yet, but I just, I'm in the habit of always calling restart kernel and run all cells. Make sure the dependencies have passed, importing transformers, importing data sets. Again, we're gonna pull in that same data set. Okay, and um, here this actually recognizes this, this load data set function actually recognizes that we've already loaded or that we have already pulled it down and it's been stuffed into a temporary directory. Here we're gonna split the data into uh, test and train. And here, let's see, we, we actually put this into a directory here called data summarization. And we're going to, let's see, what do we do in here? We're going to load the, just the train data set here. So, and here we've just added some nice kind of, you know, ways to, uh, to highlight, like, what is the actual prompt just in case we're, we're going to do, you know, multi prompt. Okay. Oh, and the, the context here, by the way, is that we are preparing, we are taking our data set, which we're pretending to be kind of an internal, uh, or yeah, not internal, but like a customer support, you know, dialogue, let's say. Like, that's not really what it is, but just kind of work with me on this, right? And what we're going to do is take this column here called dialogue and this summary, we're going to templatize and slam them into um, a uh, textual um, input and label that we're going to pass to the model so that the model can learn uh, and modify its weights, right? and then be able to generalize on other um, like support conversations, okay? So here is our input, which we're gonna call prompt. Here's our summary, which we're calling uh, summary. Now, this is the baseline human summary. This is what we're going to use as our label, as our ground truth for training, okay? We just have a simple function here to do that uh, tokenization and to, you know, get the data into that format where it actually looks like a um, instruction, right? Like a, a, a command to our model. And so this is just a bunch of boilerplate code here that I'm going to skip through. But the end result here is we, we will have a data set that we can then use to fine tune. So Skipping through a lot of this. So, and then we do have, so this was like the CSV version of the data. So I'll just crack this open real quick. That's the same thing I was showing up in this view on, on Hugging Face. And then here's the process version, which actually uh, ends up as a parquet file. So it's not really human readable, but is good for um, our fine tuning process here. All of that goes into a uh, local variable or a, a session variable here, a like global variable that we're calling the data process path. So that's gonna get picked up by the next notebook. So all that we did there was just run, um, was just take the data set, we um, right, like wrapped it in a prompt uh, and grab the uh, human label and we're about to pass all that in. I'm gonna skip 6B. 6B is, you know, so six and seven are like the in notebook versions just within Studio. 6B and 7B are, how do we actually do that at scale with SageMaker and a SageMaker cluster? This is very useful to know because customers will wanna do this, but for purposes of today, I do wanna stick with just the notebook version. So. Um, but really, it's the same code um, that's just been wrapped up in this preprocess.py. Um, you know, here, this is pretty much the same code that, that came out of the notebook uh, that we did in six, except it's going to launch a uh, SageMaker processing job with a cluster and all the fun things that happen there. Um, all of these, by the way, do get fed into 08, which is a complete. Uh, like ML Ops pipeline that takes about 20 minutes to run. We're not going to do that. We're just going to jump right into uh, seven here. So think of six 
as the feature engineering. Seven is where we're actually going to do the, the training or what we often call fine tuning. Okay. And, and the reason that we call it fine tuning, by the way, is that these models have already been trained and in some cases they've, they've not only been, you know, uh, trained on millions and billions of documents on the internet, but they could have been trained on something more specific, like what we're doing here. And then we could take this version. Um, we're going to create a checkpoint. We're going to then pass that maybe to some other team within our organization, who's then going to fine tune it further. Um, or we would do what's called uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback. And that's one of the extras that we're going to get to today. So just to, to sort of give you context, um, we right now are still in this phase one here. Okay. And, um, or what's called step one. So we've got, you know, uh, data that has been labeled by the human. We're, we're doing what's, what's typically called supervised fine tuning SFT. It just depends on which paper that you're reading. Uh, but you know, this is giving, uh, the like, input and then label and letting the model figure out what is the best, um, weights that can produce good summaries. Okay. And then, um, so I'm just doing kernel run all like this, this is going to run through. It's going to grab the model checkpoint that we loaded, I think in 05 or, or something, just to make sure that we're using it's the, the, you know, Google T5 base. Here, it's going to load in all those friendly transformers. This is, um, and yeah, like interesting story about the transformers library when, um, right? Like me and Ancha, Ancha and I <clears throat> like set out to write our book. Transformers was just getting started. And so, yeah, I remember Ancha and I, you know, this is probably two years ago now, we actually sat down and like we were implementing, uh, you know, BERT and these different algorithms by hand based on Google papers and, you know, reference implementations that we found on the internet. And then one day I was Googling around and discovered this, um, this package called Transformers. I ditched all that crappy code that I wrote and I found someone else's library that had all kinds of, you know, features and, um, and then since then, you know, hugging face, uh, seems to really be taking off. So great partnership with those folks. They know, uh, language stuff really well. They're starting to get into, uh, some of the image stuff as well. We've seen this code a number of times. Now I want to point something out and this is going to become important later. When we talk about LoRa and PEFT and, and, um, you know, the efficient fine tuning, uh, here we are actually going to fine tune and make updates to 100% all 250 million parameters that are in plan T5, the base version that we're using here. Okay. And so why am I showing this? Of course, we're going to update all the weights is because in the like extra section, I'm going to show you how we can achieve very similar results and just train a very tiny fraction, 1%, for example, of these weights and still get pretty good results. And so this actually helps address the problem of, you know, not uh, requiring huge GPU clusters. Um, I can actually fit these models oftentimes in a single GPU and perform training uh, with very small resources on some, you know, pretty large data sets. Okay, uh, so keep keep in mind 250 million. This actually seems like a small model compared to, you know, the um, uh, typical 175 billion parameter. And that's just because of, you know, frugality and, and our core principles here, but you can very easily make this a much larger model and, you know, go up to the 11 billion, which is the, I think the max for plan T5, uh, double XL. Um, okay. And here we're going to load the processed data. So that's coming from this, that's the, uh, you know, processed, uh, parquet files. And so we'll show what that looks like here in a sec. So we have our, our training split, our validation split and our test split. So to train, we have about 13,000 samples. So rows in our, 
uh, so that's you know separate dialogues with their um, with like the actual label. And once again, we're just going to see you know so this is I think a different example here. We had looked at uh, a couple examples earlier. Now let's take a look at um, this other example here. And hi, my name is John Sandals. I've got a reservation. Um, so person one appears to be talking to someone at a hotel. They're trying to check in. Uh, they presented the American Express. Um, they don't take American Express. If you remember those days, actually, it still might be that way. Um, I haven't used Amex in um, a bunch of years, but and there's this kind of like negotiation. So. The model says John Sandals has a reservation at the Venetian Hotel. Now, I don't believe I see anything in here about the Venetian Hotel, do we? Uh, does not look like the Venetian is mentioned. So, the, so this, so this model with just without any fine tuning is like just making stuff up. <laughs> but you know, seems to maybe have a lot of data on hotels on, on the Venetian, okay? And so it just kind of throws that in, I guess, as a nice little extra piece of information, call that hallucinating. Uh, it seems pretty confident though. The human summary is John Sandals has a reservation, person one um, asks for his identification and credit card and helps him uh, check in. This is actually not right. And so I, um, you know, that's why we we uh, chose this example. Is it's actually, uh, you know, person two asks person one for their identification, right? So it's slightly wrong. That's a human error. So now let's see if if our model can actually pick that up and do better than the human labeled response. So this is where we're setting up to run ultimately our train.fit call here. And this is all hugging face magic. This is all stuff I used to have to write on my own. It was painful. Um, here's some of the hyperparameters, you know, learning rate, the number of the epics, uh, the batch sizes, the weight decay. Um, I have to be perfectly honest with you. I typically just grab whatever I see in a paper um, for someone else, you know, that uh, someone else has done similar to what I'm trying to do, uh, or some other example that I see has good uh, results. Um, you, you can perform hyperparameter tuning. Just know that um, it's going to be relatively expensive in terms of, you know, number of compute hours. Uh, but, you know, for the most part here, you, you kind of stick to similar, um, uh, values that you see, right? Like other folks using, yes, other researchers using. So uh, we're, we are not gonna do hyperparameter tuning today. That's a pretty well-known concept. There's tons of ways to do it. Uh, it's, it's not the most uh, critical piece uh, for, for this workshop anyway, but this certainly is something to keep an eye on, particularly the batch size, by the way. To, if, and if you are using GPUs and if you do have limited memory, the, the batch size could actually cause you out of memories. And so oftentimes uh, I start with batch size of one and just see how far I get. Um, and then I increase the batch size and suddenly I'll start hitting out of memory. And then maybe I have to do some other tricks. There's a lot of tricks to work around the, the uh, GPU memory limitation. Um, at some point we'll have tons and tons of GPU RAM like we do CPU RAM. And, this will all be just fun stuff to talk about in you know five or ten years, but that's the state of things right now. So we call trainer dot train. Uh, now we do only do this right now for one epic uh, with a very small batch size. That's on purpose. We don't have a whole lot of time. So what we've done is we've actually offline trained and pushed it up to S3, and we we pull down one that was trained overnight or or I think for a few hours on, you know, GPUs. Uh, and so it's kind of, if you've ever seen those cooking shows where they put the, uh, you know, pan or the, the cake in the oven, and then they pretend and they go to the second oven and the cake is done. So uh, we've done a little bit of that here just to keep things moving. You can, however, try um, and to increase these and do, you know, larger batch sizes or 
or sorry, more like epics, you can change this. There's some instructions here to try uh, higher values, but just know that we've done that for you. So we're gonna swap in uh, the, the cake that we've already baked and uh, we're gonna load that thing up. We're gonna call this the tune model. And, uh, okay. And by the way, here's some of the gory details of what's behind these models. So you can, uh, you know, start to, to put the pieces together. If you're familiar with transformers and things, you see the number of, of heads, uh, the attention heads and all these things, you know, make sense once you start, um, you know, really diving deep, uh, which we do in, in our book. I keep pointing down here because it's sitting right next to me. Uh, and let's see. Yeah, Ancha, I'll pause there. Any questions? Yeah, maybe just a quick, yeah, maybe a five minute break here to give people time to catch up and maybe logically recap the steps we've done okay. from five to seven here. Yeah. So if you want to just make sure that you do restart and then run all cells uh, to get through this whole thing and then we can uh, take a look. So, yeah, so five. We we just did sort of the um, you know prompt engineering, uh, which like a very light sort of engineering where we're just trying different different um, ways to instruct our model with our data set. Um, six we we used that knowledge. We we found a good um, you know prompt which is summarize the following conversation. And then summary colon. We we have carried that into uh, this. We have now taken our data set and um, using that prompt as a template. These are called prompt templates typically, and we can slam them in uh, with like our data set. We can merge with that template, and that becomes our data set that we are then going to use to fine tune. So step five, we did no model updates. Step six and seven is where we're doing. Um, our model updates, specifically uh, notebook seven, okay. And six B and and seven B are just the sort of SageMaker scalable, uh, you know, ways to extend it out to hundreds of GPUs. All right, and the the goal here is we're trying to find or train a language model that can summarize a uh, conversation at least as good as the human baseline. Um, that way we don't need the human to actually summarize anymore as new dialogue comes in. We are hoping that once we, we, we give the model enough summaries, you know, um, uh, that it, it will learn to be able to um, uh, right, like do that and like generalize to other conversations that it hasn't seen. All right, so I'm gonna kind of just get to the gist here, which is, so up here we have fine tunes. Now here, you know, once again, we, we just ran for one epic. Here we are pulling in the model that has been uh, trained offline and you know a lot of this looks looks pretty scary if you think about it just from logically what's happening though which is what we're trying to do here today we're going to show you that um, uh, that we are training a model that does even better than the human baseline okay so here is here's our our data set that's been wrapped in this prompt template that we explored in 05. The, um, so the non instruction fine tuned or the, just the, the base flan T5, you know, gave us this craziness about the Venetian hotel, um, which was nice, but it's starting to like hallucinate a little bit. And it's not something that really represents what happened. Our further fine tune. So we took our data set and you know ran it through. So this first one, Flan T5 didn't see the actual human label. 
when we did the instruction fine tuning in the cells above, it did see the actual label. Okay. Um, or, well, for for uh, the uh, training data set. Here we're using a uh, like holdout data set. So just like your like typical machine learning, you have you know a training split that's maybe eighty percent or ninety percent of your data. Uh, here I think it was about thirteen thousand, and then you have a, a validation split which I think was about seven hundred, and then you have your test split which is seven hundred. So here we're using we are training on the training data, you know, giving it the summaries and the dialogue, and then uh, we are then switching to our test holdout data set and seeing how well it's doing on data that the model has not seen. So let's see. So the the model that we've trained inside of this notebook says John Sandals has a reservation checks in with his visa. Okay, that's pretty accurate. Person two asked to, uh, him, uh, helps him check in and approves his reservation. So now we're actually seeing something better. And and this actually beats the human who has a mistake and, set, and labels person two as the person checking in uh, this person one named John Sanders. Okay. So we did choose some, some careful examples here to highlight, you know, a, a bad human uh, compared with a uh, like hallucinating base plan T5 compared with our instruction fine tuned version. So, you know, this isn't always the case, but uh, that, and so that's the qualitative uh, result here. Now, um, there's a typo here that should say quantitative, and it should say rouge instead of rogue. Um, but now we're, we are going to not necessarily rely on our human eyeballs, which is, which is what we just did, but now we're going to actually put some statistics behind this. We're going to use this metric called Rouge. Rouge is a statistical method that can compare the original uh, dialogue to the summary. And based on a bunch of different techniques, you know, the uh, least or the uh, lowest, or sorry, the, the uh, longest common sequence and um, uh, right, like n-gram analysis, we can put a number behind how well did the summary uh, summarize, okay, that uh, conversation. So Rouge is a metric that uh, actually has quite a lot of criticism around how, you know, well it works and how, like, accurate it is, uh, but it's better than, you know, nothing, really. So really, when, when we start to do the evaluation, things get a little fuzzy. And they'll get fuzzier when we do the uh, reinforcement uh, learning stuff later, where we're going to actually detoxify um, the summaries that are being generated. And so that's where then the statistics actually aren't really a good way uh, to measure. So maybe you have to combine the statistics with like a toxicity score um, and things get a little trickier. But, um, you know, that's also one of the real breakthroughs, I feel, with these large language models and, you know, with um, what we're seeing these days with the reinforcement learning and, and the uh, human aspect to this, is that we are essentially breaking away from the traditional, you know, statistical measurement of, uh, you know, does the summary contain the same number or, or the most important words that came from the dialogue? Because that's not always uh, right. Like, like that's not the best for the human necessarily. That's not taking into account human nuances, the you know nuances of a language. If I'm trying to detoxify the response from the model, and there's there's a bunch of hate speech that's in the original dialogue, you know, I don't necessarily want to capture that that hate speech in my response. I want to maybe soften it up a little bit, which we call detoxification which we're gonna to get to um, in the like extra section here, which will be really cool. All right, the rest of this is just boilerplate calculating rouge. So rouge, um, that's, you know, one gram, two gram. Um, uh, L is the longest uh, common sequence, I believe. 
So what we're seeing here is that the original model without any fine tuning, this is just base flan T5, right? Base, this is flan T5 base. And higher is better, by the way. And then this is our, um, our fine tuned model on top of flan T5 base. So here we see almost double in like a lot of cases uh, that the, um, so for, for as much as you believe in this Rouge metric, you know, which again does have criticism, it is one way to measure, you know, how well are we doing, right? And, um, you know, maybe it's not the best, but let's just keep uh, moving here. So, and calculating percentage wise, we see that we get about a 20% bump on, on the Rouge 1 uh, metric, Rouge 2 about 10%, uh, you know, uh, Rouge L 13% and sort of Rouge L some, um, you know, about 13.69%. So we do see a bump. Now keep, uh, so keep these numbers in mind because we, we are actually going to revisit them. Actually, I show them again, so you don't have to memorize them, but just know that we do see a bump in the Rouge metric. And uh, qualitatively, we did see an improvement where it actually did better than what the human did. All right. Okay, Antra. Um, should we keep moving here? We got about 30 minutes. I guess we didn't really take a five minute break, did we? <laughs> yeah, I think um, if you want to continue and then we'll just use the remaining probably like maybe 20 minutes um, to answer questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, question. Yeah, about quantitative for Rouge uh, for like images. Yeah, we can try to answer those in a little bit. Um, let me keep going. So the next section is going to be in this WIP directory. So, oh, and so 7B is doing what we did in, in 7, but doing it on the SageMaker cluster. So something, uh, if you are working with customers, you certainly want to do. 08 is tying all of this together. Um, and in fact, you can run 08 uh, and and it'll do everything end to end and actually build the pipeline that that does um, you know all of these steps that we discussed. And then you could actually deploy the model as an endpoint and then you know try it, uh, you know, give it some sample um, right like dialogue. And uh, but I do want to make sure that we get to, so pardon my scroll here, but, and right, so again, we are still in this step one, right? So now all of this is just step one. Step two, we are actually not going to do because we have a pretty good reward model. Okay, oh, so step two and three are where we get into the reinforcement learning. Um, and if you're familiar with reinforcement learning, uh, you need some kind of like reward model to say whether or not the action that you've taken should be reinforced, should, should be rewarded, or if it should be sort of negatively rewarded to say, don't take that action again. And um, so step two and step three, uh, we will actually jump straight to step three where we're gonna do the reinforcement learning and um and uh oh actually there, there is one other thing that uh, we were going to do before we get into reinforcement learning so hold that thought for a second um put that on the stack step one here there's actually a uh a better way yeah i would say pretty much ubiquitously better than having to train all 250 million of these parameters. So let's jump into the WIP uh, directory here. And this is, you know, the extra stuff that, um, as far as I know, no one's actually demoed. I know Clay uh, uh, yeah, has not demoed this yet. Um, so this is what's called parameter efficient fine tuning. The whole world calls it PEFT, so you can just call it PEFT. The, specific variant of PEFT that we're going to use today is called LORA. LORA stands for low rank uh, representation adaptation. 
Now, the uh, general gist here is if you're familiar with something called singular value decomposition, for example, where you are lowering, you know, the uh, number of weights that you need to train in order to capture the like essence of this language task, right? Which is summarization. So we are going to go through almost the exact same steps that we did in seven, except we're going to use this uh, LoRa technique, which is a type of, of PEFT. Okay. So same thing. We should be on the eight CPU, thirty-two gig. Um, I would recommend. Uh, actually, it looks like I committed this with the output, um, but you can run it. You could do restart and run all cells. And so we're, I uh, jumped the gun a little bit. We are not talking about reinforcement learning just yet. We are going to do the same thing that we did in 07, but we're going to use this lower rank representation that um, allows us. So here, this is all the same things I'm importing. Oh boy, here's that data wrangler. Uh, just if you see this uh, data wrangler thing, just close it and don't show again later. That's a studio advertisement that pops up every now and then. Um, all the same imports, all the same data set. And note that we are adding two more libraries here. One is called LoRa lib, and then one is called PEFT, right? And these libraries. Yeah, so someone's asking, uh, what's the benefit of this? And I'm going to get to that here. So we're, we're loading the same data set. We're doing the same split. We're loading the same base model, same tokenizer, all the shenanigans. Here is, uh, the, the same number. Oh. Uh, I hope. I hope I have enough resources here. Let's see. All right, give me one sec here because my kernel appears to have died. So I'm going to close, close, close. Close that T3, we don't need it. And close, close, close. I'm just looks creating like up resources. Yeah, it looks like everyone's kernel died at the same point, Chris. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you might just want to watch Chris doing it. Yeah, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm just going over here uh, and closing. So, um, yeah, Ansha, do we not have those the shutdown resources at the end? I thought we did. Oh, no, we don't. Okay, so that that's, yeah, that's something we have to add is the release resources. I spent all that time explaining it and we're not even doing it um, in, in all the notebooks. So the way to work around it, honestly, is to just go to this uh, little circle and the square thing or whatever, and just close anything that you're not currently using. That's just, that will still keep the notebook up here. It's just not occupying any resources. And then we should be able to do restart kernel and run all. Uh, Laura works everywhere. Laura is magical. Um, so I just saw a quick question here while I'm running. And you can go to the Laura page. And this is actually from our uh, fine friends over at Microsoft. And Laura is used for vision. Laura is used for everything under the sun. It's a it's a technique. Um, it's a, a sort of generic technique that, you know, uh, similar to how singular value decomposition can be used pretty much anywhere, you know, that um, that involves any kind of, you know, matrix math or um, so. And here's here's a table actually. So yeah, here's Laura plus Dream Dream Booth. Uh, and so I'll give you that link there. So this is actually Hugging Faces uh, PEFT library, which is what we're using. And we see if this can be used everywhere. So think of it like 
instead of, and I still haven't gotten to the essence here. Uh oh, did that crash again? Oh, let me try it one more time because that should not, this thing should run. And yeah, we'll close all these here. Oh, wait. Is it because of that CSV? No, that seems kind of silly. Okay. So, either way, let me just explain what's happening here. The Okay, so I'm I'm going to skip through here, but this is showing that 100%. So this is before using PEFT. So this notebook actually does it without PEFT and then with PEFT. And it um, so actually right. I uh, forgot I'm doing this. Um, this is in the sort of extras area, but uh, this notebook actually does the exact same thing that we did in seven as well as Laura. And so it should just run though. And then let me get to the gist here, which is the number of parameters. Oh, right. Yes, I do it all because I, I then compare all the different techniques at the end. Um, okay, so parameter. Uh, so if you jump down to the step three here, yeah, this talks about the PEFT stuff. So PEFT is the generic term that includes LoRa as well as prompt tuning, which we always emphasize is not the same as prompt engineering. Um, in most cases, what I've noticed with customers is when they, they say PEFT, they actually mean LoRa. I would say 95% of the time, that's what they mean. Um, and so the, like sort of looking out or, or you know, out, side in, like very high level, you can train or, or uh, fine tune your model with the same data set using much, much less compute resources because you're not updating all of the weights. So think of it sort of logically, and this is not exactly how it's implemented, but think of it logically as sort of wrapping your, um, right, like original LLM. And so the original, model, our Flan T5, or um, yeah, yes, our Flan T5, those weights don't change at all. And all that comes out is this really, really light weight, um, right, like uh, it's simply called um, a, uh, right, like the adapter. And so that adapter might be 10 megabytes as opposed to one uh, gigabyte for Flan T5. And so now you can basically have a single base model that is close to, you know, one gig and have these really lightweight, right? Like PEFT adapters or right, like LoRa, uh, like adapters that are specific to either a tenant, you know, let's say you're building a multi-tenant SaaS. That's one of the customers I'm uh, working with right now that has um, about 10,000 customers. They don't want to train and, and do full fine tuning on 10,000 of these large language models. They want one, you know, base model, uh, which is huge, you know, one gig or right, like two or three gigs, and then swap in only when they need to make a prediction for that specific tenant. Swap in just that 10 megabyte adapter. So, it's a little bit more complicated than that, specifically LoRa is, in that it goes deeper into the neural network and kind of, you know, think of it like wrapping specific parts of the network. So uh, there is what's called like a merge, uh, like operation that, you know, typically needs to happen. So it's not as nimble as I'm describing it, where you could swap it in, you know, at like if you have this um you know rest endpoint like an http endpoint that can take requests from ten thousand customers it's not able to to swap them in that quickly right so we're 
a little bit further from from that point. It's just the way that the math works out. It, it's the way that the you know transformer works out. Uh, the way that these architectures, these models are currently architected. But you know that said, and if this uh, yeah, so once I I close the uh, dialogue some CSV and got rid of some resources. Looks like we're uh, getting further. Here I'm only training. Uh, what is this? 3 million parameters out of the original 250 million. So this is 1%, approximately 1.5% of the parameters actually need to be updated. Okay. So that's huge. So, so that basically means, you know, 98.5% of my model, um, right? Like does not need to change at all and so that base uh, language model stays intact and we are just adding this extra you know uh, like peft adapter yeah so laura uh, like adapter okay and so all of the code looks the same except for there's one extra step here where we define this uh, laura configuration now, if you think about singular value decomposition and you know the rank of your uh, matrices, you know think of eigenvalues and eigenvectors and all that kind of fun stuff from school. You the the hyperparameter that most people pay attention to when they're doing LoRa is this rank, and this will directly affect and increase or decrease the number of these parameters. Now. The papers I've read and the experience and the empirical um, uh, studies that that I've done, this number is typically either eight or sixteen, very very small. <laughs> um, for uh, the purpose here, I chose thirty-two. I actually can't remember why I chose thirty-two, um, but. You can play, so this is a hyperparameter that, that you uh, typically do want to pay attention to, okay? Uh, some of these others are just, you know, yeah, some like extra things that like you can look into. Um, plan T5, you have to use this particular, what's called task type. But now keep in mind that you can train these, right, like adapters, really lightweight adapters on either task specific, things like maybe I have one that's good for summarization. Maybe I have I I fine tune one that's really good for summarization for uh, tenants, you know, B. And maybe it's different than the summarization uh, for, you know, tenant C. Or there's other tasks, right? Like question answer and, and things. And I can create these really lightweight PEFT adapters um, that that can be combined with the base um, you know, flan T5, and yes, everything uh, is, you know, nice and tight. Okay, so all of this looks the same, except, and I'm still using trainer by, you know, hugging face, but now I've wrapped it in what's called uh, a PEF model. So I've taken the original model, which is flan T5, I've given it that Laura config, which has the rank, I create this PEF model, and I print out how many trainable parameters. There's the 1.4%. And then from that point on, right, like everything is the same. Now, we've gone ahead and done that trick with the, uh, you know, cooking show. And I do want to show that uh, this is 14 megabytes. If I think up above in this notebook, um, I showed the size of Flan T5 itself is like, I think it's one gig. And so instead of maintaining one gig, uh, you know, variance for summarization for tenant B and summers and question answer for tenant A and having this explosion, um, I, I have one single base model and then many of these LoRa uh, like adapters that are only 14 megs each. And then the other benefit besides, you know, disk space, which isn't really that big of a deal, um, right, but like obviously in memory, um, right, uh, this helps, but then also during fine tuning time, much, much less resources needed. Um, and uh, okay, so 
uh, what am I doing here? Qualitative. Oh, and then the other thing to keep in mind is when you do go to load this heft model, there is this parameter called is trainable. And so up here I have, um, I have uh, fine tuned and then created those, right? Like heft adapters that are only 14 meg. Now I'm, I'm simulating from, from here down would be like the inference. So now let's do inference with the PEFT model. Okay, probably put a comment in there, it'd be good to show. And here we are loading it from where we saved it up above. When we load it, we have to give it the base model, which was untouched during the PEFT training. We then combine it with our PEFT uh, checkpoint, right, the LoRa checkpoint, and we say is trainable false because we're not planning to do any further training. If I set this to true, which we'll actually do when we do the reinforcement learning here in a bit in the next notebook, um, if I set it to true, then it would be those you know three million or so uh, parameters because we would go back to then continuing to tr to train PEFT. But for the purpose of the rest of this notebook, we are putting it into is trainable equals false, which means inference mode. Now, from a systems level, the reason why it's good to uh, reduce the number of these trainable parameters is when you have a numeric value that cannot change, right? That That is, uh, right, like, it, it's not mutable, right? So it's the immutable, there are less, like systems operations, you know, down to the the uh, kernel level, the like operating system kernel level, I don't need to support any update functions, right? And so, because they're all read only, that greatly simplifies my neural network graph. I mean, you know, like this is getting into way more stuff than than we should be talking about here. But there is always benefits to read only versus something that can be updated in terms of, you know, system resources. So because we know that we're just going to be predicting, we do is trainable equals false. Here we set up those same prompts. I'm just going to zip right through this. Um, now, you can kind of eyeball this a little bit. So person one, um, let's see, where is the original prompt? I can't remember what, I can't remember what the original prompt here was, but the baseline summary is person one teaches person two how to upgrade software. Um, this is the original Flan T5, starts getting a little crazy, starts to you know hallucinate maybe a little bit. Um, our fine tuned without PEFT, what's called full fine tuning, where we were updating all 250 million, um, does a you know pretty decent job, nice and succinct. And the uh, PEFT model actually does pretty well as well. So that's sort of the qualitative. Now let's talk about Rouge real quick and just uh, put a pin on this. And you know, here we show side by side what the human baseline is. Uh, I should probably expand the table here so you could see it, but these are all of the summaries. Let's look at the actual numbers here. So all of this together, we see that PEFT over the human baseline was about 17% on, you know, Rouge 1 um, and so, eight, and then Rouge 2, Rouge L, and then Rouge L sum. These over the instruct model that we did in notebook seven, we took a slight hit, okay? We're still better than the baseline, but we're not as good as the full fine tune. And so that's the, you know, one downside is that, uh, and this could change with a higher rank, you know, um, and so that's where you might actually want to do a little bit of like hyperparameter tuning. But the benefits of being able to even do this on a single GPU and still get 17% over the human baseline or, you know, 8% in some cases, 12%. Um, might be actually fine. And like often with our customers who are, you know, um, just naturally very cost conscious, showing them something like this 
they're like perfectly fine with, you know, maybe one or 2% less on these metrics. Okay. Uh, and, and with the trade off being the cost of actually fine tuning was a single GPU versus a fleet of, you know, um, eight like GPUs, uh, you know, which might cost eight to 10 times as much per hour. Okay. Um, is it possible that Laura could do better than full fine tuning? I, I have seen cases uh, like this. Yes. Uh, very dependent though on the, um, you know, data set and the task and the base model, by the way. And so, again, we are, are doing all of this with a very small model, you know, relative. So 250 million parameters um, is, you know, relatively low compared to some other ones. Okay. We have about 10 minutes left and I want to show you the reinforcement learning. Ansha, yeah, anything holding us up from that? A bunch of Laura questions, um, but let's show, I think people are excited to see the reinforcement learning stuff. Let's, let's go over that and then we can stick around a little bit and uh, maybe take some of the top questions. Okay. And, uh, there's a time is not defined. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah. Just import time there or whatever. Uh, but I think it works. Okay. RLHF. So we are going to build on what we just did. And we are actually going to use the LoRa uh, version of our model, which we saw was not as high as, you know, the full fine tuned in this case. And we want to make sure that there's no hate speech in our generated summaries. Okay. And so. The way to do this is if I go back to, um. I probably should put the diagram in these notebooks because they're more relevant. But back to this this famous chart here. So we're going to use a reward model that Facebook created called the uh, hate speech model. Now, Facebook created this as part of a Kaggle competition, you know, a couple of years ago. What this is, this hate speech. Uh, Right, like reward model is we, we feed it text and it'll tell us whether or not that text is hate speech or it's not hate speech. Okay. Now it's certainly not hundred percent accurate. And, uh, there are different definitions of hate speech to different people in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. Uh, but we will get a sense of using this kind of reward model. We can detoxify or reduce the toxicity. I, um, yes, I want to be very careful to say that we are not completely detoxifying, even though you might see that term used here, we are reducing the, uh, toxicity. Okay. So that's the, so we are not actually going to train the, um, that like reward model. We found one out there that, you know, does fine for us. What we're going to do is jump to step three and we are going to take the instructed fine tuned model, which we used PEFT and, you know, Laura and. Um, and that like dialogue summarization, uh, data set, and we are going to soften it up or we are going to soften up the summaries that it generates. Okay. And we will do that using this reinforcement learning technique called PPO. Uh, it's relatively advanced, but it all ends up where there's a loss function and we are, um, going to actually modify our um, uh, like language model and specifically because we're using PEFT. So this is where everything comes together. We are not actually updating the base flan T5. We are just updating that 14 megabyte uh, PEFT adapter and just softening it up a little bit so that the summaries that it generates are going to be a little bit less toxic. Okay. Now we don't train for that long. Um, I do want to warn, you know, that, uh, actually this data set does not have that, that much toxicity in it to begin with. Um, when Ancha and I first built this demo, we were using an absolutely awful, uh, data set. That's actually very commonly used to, uh, demo this, um, that like, I couldn't even tolerate, you know, myself, like it was just 
so bad, some of the things that were said there. So um, if you do the run all here, and hopefully we don't run out of resources, if you do just go over and, you know, kill um, the lower one here, and I'm going to kill the supervised one uh, that I just needed for the image. So run this one. Now, RLHF is the term. So similar to PEFT, the entire uh, like industry calls this RLHF, reinforcement learning, which is just the implementation that we're using. HF is human feedback. And human feedback here comes in the form of this hate speech reward model. So at some point, um, you know, Facebook as part of a competition, they presented a whole bunch of, um, you know, bad terms, bad, bad phrases and had humans, you know, uh, right, like label things. And if you're familiar with like SageMaker Ground Truth where you're presented, uh, you know, a, uh, think of you're, you're being presented a conversation and you're being presented, you know, two or three different possible summarizations. And one of them is, is not toxic and the other two are toxic. Uh, the human has been asked, for example, to select the non-toxic. Now, this is probably the absolute worst job you could ever think of because uh, you do have to read all three of them and there's you know, some bad things in there. But at the end of the day, we have this, um, yeah, this like reward model that is essentially, uh, some of you might have already picked up a uh, binary classifier. And the two classes are not hate and hate. And the 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 thing to note is in order for that 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 dialogue or that that summary that's being generated in order for that thing to be considered hate it typically has to be really bad right and so our data set is not really that bad to start with um it's been you know cleansed pretty well but we will still see uh a bump in uh a decrease in the like overall toxicity score. And so I will introduce toxicity score here as a evaluation metric that we're going to use. Um, but like before that real quick, I do want to call out the imports here, transformers, just like we've been using the whole time, uh, data sets, uh, PEFT. So here's, you know, all the PEFT stuff that we use, LoRa, all the good stuff. Uh, now we're going to use this library called TRL. This is what's going to give us PPO, which is that uh, like implementation um, of uh, reinforcement learning that is very you know commonly used. This is like documented in like a lot of papers, um, and so TRL uh, works really well with both the PEFT library that we're using and with transformers. In fact, I think it's maintained by someone from Hugging Face. Uh, but it's not an official Hugging Face project for some reason. Yes, anyway, it's very well maintained. Whenever I have some issue, I either go out there and then realize that they just fixed it like three days before and then, you know, pull in the latest code or they are like already working on it or there's a workaround or something. So, uh, you know, very cool model. Now, we're not going to get into the specifics of PPO, but just know that it's a slightly different um, like loss function. But just know that the PPO trainer is actually, you know, back propagating based on a, a slightly more complicated loss function um, that takes into account this, this softening is the term that I tend to use when I describe this. Uh, and it's, it, it works with the reward model, which is the, you know, hate speech model uh, to actually um, so first it's going to generate, and yeah, I'll like walk through this code here in a sec. It's going to generate uh, a summary for a, a given set of dialogue. It's gonna then run all of that through the reward model and get back whether or not it's hate speech or it's not hate speech. And then it's going to make changes to our model through those PEFT layers. And uh, that that continues to happen until either we stop it, um, or we you know run out of data, or um, or like otherwise. And then the output of that is now our new uh, like LLM and specifically PEFT adapter that we then push out to production, and we start seeing um, these less toxic 
uh, responses. So all of this seems very magical, I know. Um, I'm gonna zip through all this. This is all the same stuff that we've done before. Here, our starting point is actually the output of, of the previous notebook, this Laura Peft. Um, so we then, that's our starting point. That's what we're gonna soften. Once again, here's our 14 megabyte uh, file. Here, we're gonna print out, oh, that's just the function here. Here's where I actually print it out. So again, about 1.4 percent is all that we're going to train, right? Because we're not going to touch the underlying um, plan T5. So uh, this is where we're actually combining PPO with PEFT uh, to make our LHF, which is, you know, kind of mind blowing to be able to sort of additively do all these things. Now, PPO has this particular property uh, that you can provide a what's called reference model that is not being updated through the, the this fine tuning process, and we will use something called KL divergence that we're trying to keep what the the PPO model is being updated with the softening, but we don't want it to stray too far from what the original model in our case the you know PEF model would actually um, right, like generate. So this is, if you're familiar with like reinforcement learning and you know, what's called uh, reward hacking, you know, there's, there's ways to like optimize for the reward function, but completely diverge from the original language model. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, PPO offers this where you can provide what's called the reference model, which will, will not get updated. Um, and so keep in mind that all of this is using a single base Flan T5 model and just using those LoRa adapters on top. So we're not actually duplicating the amount of memory that's needed. It's able to, to do all this uh, with a single base model. So this is fantastic. Yes, uh, someone asked, is this like KL divergence from Instruct GPT? That's exactly what it is. There's a paper um, by the OpenAI folks uh, called Instruct GPT that uh, describes this uh, to the T. Yeah, that's right. And KL divergence is a, is a statistical way. You provide two distributions um, and you want to compare them. And essentially, you know, there's some value that um, you set and say that you don't want those to diverge more than, you know, a certain value, okay? So, um, you know, KL divergence, when I was first doing this, I didn't really pay attention to it. I was like, whatever, that's like an extra step I'll deal with later. Um, you do notice quite a big difference though, if you don't pay attention to it, if you're not trying to optimize for it, uh, because you can actually run PPO without this reference model. And it'll just learn to optimize for the reward function. Think of it like it's just always going to generate something non-toxic. And it has nothing to do with what the original summary or, you know, uh, the original conversation had in there. All right. So uh, the key to all of reinforcement learning, of course, is this uh, reward model. Again, here we're, we are actually using a form of BERT. So Facebook, when they train this model, you know, BERT is a, is a relatively uh, small uh, language model these days. When Ansh and I wrote the book, it, was, it seemed pretty big, but, uh, and yeah, we cover BERT um, in, uh, you know, great detail within the book. Uh, and so Facebook has a variant of BERT called Roberta, um, and that's what they use to train this, this hate speech classifier. So. We just load this thing in. We do print out here. What are the two classes? Always a good thing to do when you're just taking a model off of the internet. We see, okay, label, um, you know, zero is not hate. Label one is hate. So that's important to know. Because what we're trying to do is we want to optimize for not hate. Okay. Um, and of course, if you get this wrong, if you accidentally um, optimize for hate, uh, you will notice it pretty quickly. And so that's kind of the, you know, silly part of this is, uh, it, it will actually start to generate more hateful 
speech, which I don't recommend, uh, right, like anyone ever do. Okay, so, uh, and why this is worth pointing out is most binary classifiers, the positive label is one, and the negative label is zero, right? And if you're not paying attention, you will just pick one as, as the positive, and you'll start generating more hateful speech, and you don't want to do that. So, Let's just run this through. Uh, let's take some, you know, what I would consider non-toxic. I want to kiss you. This spits out some, you know, logits here, uh, probabilities between not hate and hate. Here we see um, I want to kiss you is 99.9% you know, uh, not hate. And so we're excited about that. The logits are what we are actually going to use as the reward. So in this implementation, we are not using zero and one as the reward or, or 0.99 or you know, 0 0.01. We are actually going to stick with the, the raw logits. And so that's what I'm calling out here. So in the zeroth position is always what we're going to use uh, for the reward, because that's what we're trying to optimize. And so here, let's take a, a negative and uh, sort of interesting, you know, I had mentioned earlier that it has to be somewhat, um, uh, you know, toxic to even trigger the non-hate. And uh, if you do all of this without the word damn here, which I didn't want to use, but this model considers it this to not be toxic. <laughs> and just by adding that word, this model now says it's toxic. Okay. So, this model is extreme and it's designed to be extreme. Um, and uh, so pick the reward model, you know, suitable to your taste. If you're just trying to um, make the summary a little bit more positive and not necessarily, you know, as extreme as catching hate speech, there are other just regular sentiment analysis, um, very easy to find um, to use you know, things that have been trained on like IMDB reviews or Amazon customer reviews, which is what we use in the book. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's the warning there, but then know that. And so here it's saying, you know, not hate is point is, you know, 2.5% and hate is 97.5. Uh, know, but what we're really looking at here is the first slot for the not hate. Uh, and so this is, you know, negative. So this is saying, um, this should be negatively rewarded and uh, negatively reinforced. Okay, here we're using something out of Hugging Face called a like inference pipeline. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but just know that it does give us this logit here, and that's all that we're interested in. So I'll skip through some of those details. Um, here we are going to um, formalize this into into a uh, concept called um, evaluation metric. And so we already saw this with Rouge in a previous notebook. Here we are um, going to actually use something called toxicity. We're giving it the same um, hate speech model that we were uh, demonstrating up above. And this is going to give us, uh, you know, very similar results here. So um, in this case, toxicity score is, you know, between zero and one. And that's just, you know, so it's going to adapt the hate speech model. We did have to tell it, by the way, which label was toxic and which label is not, because otherwise it doesn't know to use the zero with or the first. And so here we say the label is hate and that's the toxic version. Okay, so this, this toxicity is expecting um, a, a classifier that does produce a um, you know, toxic or uh, non-toxic, okay? So zipping through all this, this is just a comedian's function here that takes in the model, takes in that toxicity evaluation metric that we created above uh, data set and can, you know, basically run through and tell us, uh, you know, for a given model. And so here we're gonna compare the original Right, that has not been fine tuned for this uh, detoxification, which is just the instruction fine tuned, the PEFT one that we did in the previous notebook. It's going to then run through it 
uh, and then give us some toxicity score, which is really just a mean and you know standard deviation over the um, toxicity of a number of samples that we're providing here. Okay, so a lot of boilerplate code here. Um, and let's get to the PPO trainer. So very similar to our hugging face trainer, you know, just kind of generic hugging face trainer where we have a learning rate. So you see there's, you know, gradient descent is happening here at some point. Uh, the loss function is buried within PPO. That's very specific to PPO, uh, which has a lot of reinforcement learning techniques like advantage and, um, yeah, obviously reward. And, you know, um, uh, there's like clipping going on. And, of course, KL divergence is factoring in here. And so here's where we pass in the reference model, which is not meant to be, to be fine-tuned. Here we pass in the PPO model. Uh, which the starting point, um, so I'm calling it the PPO model because this is what we're actually going to um, train. And that's, you know, starting point was what we did in the previous notebook. Um, you know, typical batch sizes, number of like epics. So uh, here we are actually not going to train this for very long just because of time purposes. Um, I don't have a baking, a cooking show version of this. So we do have to sit through about 10 of these. Just know that PPO is a very expensive um, process. It's a little bit cheaper because we're using PEFT, uh, but just know that when we call, ultimately, we're calling a um, a uh, like model update here, and that's that's like behind this step uh, function here. And so the the gist here is that we we actually ask the model to generate for a, a given prompt, it's going to generate the response uh, without, right, like any, oh, and, and so this is the, you know, like PPO variant. So the first time through, there's going to be no difference. It's gonna generate, you know, right, like whatever it, it um, it was generating before the uh, like reward function was you know being uh, like evaluated. So and then slowly we are making change. Oh, and so that 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 prompt and that generated response are then combined and passed to the reward function, which then scores it and says this is you know either uh, toxic or it's not toxic. Here's the reward, you know, logit uh, negative four for bad and, you know, positive two for good. Uh, and all of that gets passed in to the, the uh, PPO. A, you know, loss function is calculated. The uh, gradients are then applied um, and changes are being made, right? And there are actual updates to the model. In this case, the heft layer. Here we're just printing out, you know, some things to keep an eye on KL divergence. Um, you know, so here it, it's kind of oscillating between sort of 29 and, you know, 37. That's not too bad. Uh, and if if the if the KL divergence does start to wildly shift, that's a bad sign. That means you've done something wrong. Um, and uh, so the other thing to keep in in to keep an eye on here is the mean returns. Uh, you know, these are all sort of PPO concepts and uh, advantages, you know, so the uh, like loss function here is is complicated in that you're sort of predicting, you know, think of like a tic-tac-toe and each move that you make, you can't really assign the reward at that moment because you don't know if you've actually won or lost. Right. So, like, you don't know the actual, um, you know, is like the overall uh, game, you know, did that move contribute to a uh, successful win? Right. So the reward is actually assigned later. So, so there's a lot going on here with PPO. Um, and it's not always, you know, the easiest thing to like understand, but just kind of stepping back a little bit, if we look at 
what was our toxicity before? What was our toxicity afterward? Oh, okay, so this actually reduced. <laughs> yeah, this happens from time to time. So our toxicity um, actually got worse, uh, right? Like apparently to on this single run. So because we are only doing PPO for about 10 steps, uh, this number actually is pretty wild. So I do need to create the cooking show version. But actually, you know, given that, let's take a quick look at qualitatively, what do we see here? So we see the original prompt, which is, you know, summarized with this dialogue. We see the response before um, this, you know, detoxification. We see the response after. And then really what's important is this is what the hate speech thing is telling us. And so for a good majority of these, we actually did make an improvement before and after. And you could sort of eyeball some of these, um, you know, bosses firing, uh, being fired, maybe uh, some of these come out better than others, but you can see a little bit of softening. Now, that doesn't mean that all the time it's going to get better, right? There's actually a few cases here where um, after detoxification, uh, things um, were, uh, right, like slightly more toxic. And so again, this is, this is tricky to demonstrate without using extremely toxic data, which I don't want to present. It's like just like completely mortifying or um, softening up this reward model a bit, okay? And just doing something like positivity. And so this, this text really has to be negative, like, or toxic to really make a big shift on, you know, this like reward before and after. But all of this process is still applicable. Uh, there, there are customers that are doing this on their own. The sort of dream state, of course, is that you don't have to go through all of this and you could skip, you know, the last two hours of our uh, conversation. Uh, that's where we're, you know, hoping to get to with services like Bedrock, uh, where you could just point Bedrock to your data in S3 and say, uh, detoxify this. Uh, and, you know, here's uh, some like parameters to try or Bedrock will uh, try these parameters themselves. So. Anyway, we're about 20 minutes over time, so I don't want to keep you folks any longer. Ancha, any uh, kind of wrap up questions we can do? And then I'm going to go through, wow, it looks like we have about 300, 400 messages in the channel here. So uh, I probably can't get to all these today, but I can just do a few. Yeah. Yeah. And and we'll we'll have a look at all of the questions here in the Slack um, after the workshop as well, if they're some are still unanswered. Um, I guess questions around the reward model. Um, if we have a sample notebook that shows how to create a custom reward, how model. To so, a reward model. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do. I have uh might actually is it still in this repo or did I I think it's in the archive. Yeah, in the archive, which it's not going to work in this workshop because it um, because of I have permissions locked down and, and things, but let me give you the the kind of the sort of overall here. So where where I'm at here is I'm in that whip directory work in progress and I'm in archive and I then there's an RLHF. Um, let me open up a couple notebooks here. And I'll just run through it. So this is an example using ground truth to generate the data to be used for human feedback, right? Um, and okay, let me get, get a lot of these uh, instance types are locked down. If you see these, uh, we have these environments locked down because we do get, you know, some fraud every now and then, not with these internal courses, but with the public courses. <laughs> so real quick, this is um, and slightly out of date screenshots, but all the things are here. Um, let me just show. Okay, so 
the notebook 12 here is called add prompts and I think responses for, uh, so this is all in the context of step two. Now, this is where you do need a fleet of humans. If you're familiar with uh, the like Databricks model Dolly, they were famous for asking all their 5,000 employees to uh, label three um, you know, things through some tool that they created internally. Uh, but think of it like, um, yeah, so like something like ground truth. So, and so this is a sample conversation. Uh, for example, I just came up with this on the fly, uh, like a few weeks ago. Hey, Ancha, will you write another book with me? Um, and, or, or yeah, yeah, that's you asking me. And then I say, yes, let's start in three months. And then you say, okay. And, and then, so that same prompt is actually shown twice here. And then there's two different answers. So actually I duplicate the prompter. I have a different version that does not have the prompt duplicated, but, and like, this is all HTML and, you know, goofy, super simple, like UI code. But the key here is that you, is that the human would label is this response correct or is this response correct? So based on this dialogue, it's the same in both cases. Uh, this second response, Ancha is gonna do it on her own, is low and um, Ancha and Chris are going to do it in three months is high. Uh, and so Ancha, I haven't really talked to you about that, but I think we're gonna write a new book uh, here in the next three months. So is this the first time that you're hearing about this? <laughs> so that's getting the code or that's getting the data in. Now that data comes in, I'm, I'm scrolling through quickly. I'm, yeah, I apologize. After that's all labeled, that data comes into S3 and it looks like this in S3. And so here's the single prompt. Anch is asking me, will you write another book? Here's the two responses. And of those two responses, this particular human labeled this particular prompt with um, the, the first one as a one, which means it was high. The second one is a two, which means it was low. This one and two is just the internal uh, details of you know, how uh, we've chosen to um, right, like configure these responses for high and low. And of course you could do three, uh, you know, three would be low, two would be medium. Um, and there are much more slick UIs, you know, where you can like drag and drop and everything. And, that, and that's really, you know, how this uh, should be done instead of two drop downs like that. But at the end of the day, there's a single prompt, two different responses. One is ranked higher than the other. Now, how do we get that in to something that can be treated or that uh, can be used to train a binary classifier for which one is better than the other? And so, uh, so by the way, this would be not toxicity, obviously. This is more, uh, I guess you would call it the helpful so there's you know three types of the human alignment. There's uh, honest, there's uh, harmless, and there's uh, helpful. And you're trying to to like optimize all three of those typically with this reinforcement learning. And so here's a case where we're taking the two responses, we are actually going to convert them into a reward. So this is really what what this comes down to. So here's the prompt. Here's two different responses and a uh, reward of one was given to the higher rank and a reward of zero was given to the lower rank. All of this then gets fed in and in Facebook's case, they use similar data, but to be hate and not hate. In uh, like our case, we are doing this to train a reward model on a helpful answer versus a non you know, helpful. Um, or maybe honest or, you know, something. And then ultimately, this is where we're going to train the reward model. So I'm just trying to show sort of iteratively what's happening here. Um, and again, these notebooks won't run, uh, I believe, as is. But ultimately, what happens is we um, have a single prompt. We have a two different responses with 
each one has a zero or a one reward. And in the case, for example, where you have three responses, where you have uh, low, medium, and high, they're converted into pairwise. And so it would be uh, the first versus the second, the first versus the third, uh, second, you know, versus the first, uh, second versus the third. So it's, uh, you know, n, n choose two, right? Uh, if like you want to get uh, mathematical. And all of those pairs get sent in uh, and, and they're used to train. And so one of them is always going to be one and one of them is always going to be zero. And so that's usually why people, uh, when they're giving this to the human, they give multiple responses because you can collect a lot more pairs if you let them rank um you know like between each other right um so response one two three and four so uh now some of you might be thinking well where does thumbs up thumbs down come in right you've seen it on chat gpt you've seen it in right like other applications thumbs up thumbs down is the zero or it's the one right or uh, thumbs up is one thumbs down is zero and it's a it's a lighter weight way of doing this ranking Ranking is preferred because, of course, you get more data and it's sort of relative, but being presented uh, a, a question and an answer and giving the user the ability to thumbs up uh, or thumbs down, that's better than uh, right, like nothing, right? You could take it one uh, degree further, which um, I do see ChatGPT doing and like has done for uh, quite some time, where not only can you do uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, you can also put in what you think should be the proper response. And so that's obviously going to be the highest weighted and then all the other ones will get ranked, you know, down below that. So, uh, and this is where you would train it. There's a specific loss function here. This loss function is a little bit more complicated because you are comparing uh, what is always called the J and the K. So I said before that you convert um, right, like everything into pairwise. So comparing, uh, you know, the the first response to the second uh, response, the first is always called J, and um, or the the highest is always called uh, J. Um, so the like highest reward. So you actually have to do the trick where you 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 take the highest reward and that's always going to be j and then k is always going to be um yes i believe that's right right Anshul? i always get that confused sorry i was answering a question which one was it the j and k yeah j and k there's that trick where j always has j to is be the preferred one yeah is the preferred okay yeah right and this is important if you screw that up everything's going to get flipped or if you don't know about that you're not going to get good results because you'll be flip flopping, you know, um, back and forth. And if you take someone else's data set, they that 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 has preferences built in, which there are plenty of these data sets. For example, Stack Exchange, you know, Stack Overflow, um, just released a public data set that has uh, questions and then preferred answer. Uh, and then non preferred answer. And so literally they have a column called, um, uh, like response J or like answer J and then answer K. And for like a couple of weeks, I just never understood why they called it J and K. It didn't make sense. And then I started reading the papers. Then I started to put two and two together. Yes. Ancha helped me also. And, and then realized that the like industry calls J the highest reward and. Oftentimes, the data sets that you're given have already done that for you. However, if you're pulling from, uh, right, like ground truth, you have to construct J to be the highest and K to be the not highest. Um, all of this goes in. This is, you know, literally, um, uh, this is something called the reward trainer that's going to train the model. Um, this is, yes, all this is doing is just training a uh, binary classifier with a custom loss function that deals with that J and K uh, preference. Okay, so that's the trick there. And then out comes this uh, reward model. This, by the way, could also use PEFT just to blow your minds. Um, 
you don't need to train the full, you know, if, if we're using BERT here, which I can't remember what I'm using in this example, I think it's a BERT model. You don't even need to use BERT. You could use um, uh, even a larger language model if you want. But yeah, oftentimes, you know, BERT, BERT does a pretty good job. Uh, I'm not seeing it offhand here. And then there's, oh yeah. And then 14 and then 15 are what I already showed, which is how to use the reward model once, once it's been trained. Both full fine tuning and PEF, which you've already seen. Okay, so we wrap it up. Yes, I think we're good to wrap it up and we'll get to the extra questions in the Slack channel separately. Yeah, I see, yes, yeah, so Asha, I keep uh, glancing, seeing your uh, questions. They're always at the, at the bottom when I glance here. For, for the image models, consider using something like recognition, um, which has, you know, which is like an AI service that we have that can classify for content moderation, right? We cover that in the book actually, um, but it's pretty straightforward. So you can use anything as the reward model. Um, you know, just know that that if you're making like remote calls to some like remote service that could slow things down. So you want to try to batch. Um, and I'm I'm pretty sure that recognition supports batches, but uh, you know, think of the, the easiest and the, the fastest way to get uh, this concept of toxic or not toxic or positive, you know, negative, uh, and just use that to start. And if there's performance problems, then you can start looking into ways to pull it all in to um, a single, you know, job. Yeah, and uh, I think that's it. Oh, Langchain. Oh, that's our favorite, right, Antje? <laughs> um, it is. And then, Keep an eye out, by the way, uh, there's going to be a big announcement soon, something me and Ansha have been working on. Um, I can't say anything about it now. It's it's under covers, but we actually, I think based on the questions I've seen, we cover probably 70, 80% of the questions asked here. Uh, it'll be an interactive thing that, that you can learn from. Um, and then, yeah, Ansha, I, I think based on uh the the notebook here I, I think it's time to get our our book on right but we're not going to do 500 pages again right we're only going to do <laughs> maybe yeah i'm not more. signing off for 500 pages anymore <laughs> <laughs> so. but yeah folks um stay tuned um there's more content coming i know everyone has asked a lot of questions here about uh, rag and link chain and all the stuff mm -hmm. we didn't get to today um we will have more content coming in the next week so just keep an eye on your social channels and emails <laughs> and slacks. Yeah. yeah, there's going to be a big announcement, so you won't be able to miss it. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks, everyone.